when you play the Game of Thrones, you subscribe and like. Or you die. There is no middle ground. All right, welcome back to the Grease God YouTube channel, and I'm joined by JC. Thank you for coming on and reviewing stuff with us again. Of course, of course. Anytime, Grease. Thanks for having me, man. It's a pleasure to see you. Pleasure to see everybody here, too. Yes, sir. And, uh, you know, we're going to be talking season two as a whole. The last time we talked, we kind of just talked about episode eight. And episode eight does have, you know, a lot to do because we did talk about the season as a whole a little bit on that stream. But it's a lot more like we're kind of like drawn back a little bit, reflective more on how the season is, maybe, you know, cooled down on on certain things. But to start out the video, I just kind of want to hear your general thoughts on, yep, or not the episode, the season as a whole. Yeah, so obviously it's been uh, a week since the season two uh, of House of the Dragon concluded. So I've had some time to kind of cool down from my initial reaction where I was kind of a bit like, what the hell did they do to my boy Damon? Um, but uh, I think if I had to think of the season as a whole, I would say that all in all, as a television show, I think it was a decent season of TV. That's, you know, separating the fact that this was not an ideal adaptation of Fire and Blood. Just as a season of television by itself, I think it was decent with some occasionally great moments. However, once I incorporate my uh, knowledge of Fire and Blood and the source material and the deviations they made, more importantly, just kind of uh, some of the decisions Ryan Condell and his team made, just for that, uh, just some of the moments that they introduced here and how it doesn't really add up to a good story, then I, I am left feeling a little bit disappointed. And I would say season two is weaker than season one. I, I agree. And I think regardless of, of where you are really on this, on this show in season two, because I think there's people on all sides of the fence, you know, some people that just straight up just don't like it. I feel like I'm kind of in that kind of camp. And there's people that, you know, like it. And there's people that are kind of, I think vast majority of people are just kind of in this middle ground where it's like yeah. season two kind of was pretty disappointing, I think, for a majority of people. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that, in which we're going to talk about a lot of those in this review. And so part of it's going to be, there's just stuff that's out of your control. You know, HBO cutting down the episodes for the season. And then there is stuff that you can control, but... Like, this is something that I'll be interested to talk about with you later on in this kind of review is like, what, how much did that actually affect what we got in this season and why we found it like disappointing? Like, yes, we didn't get a lot of the payoff to some of the buildup of the season, but in terms of like what we actually got, even some of the stuff we got wasn't that great as a whole. So that I think is part of it. But to me, like my actual thoughts on it, I think it was pretty like okay to like mid. I'm um, just I gave it a six out of ten, just just in general, which isn't a great rating. That that's you know, that's under like a, the 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 C rating. So yeah, it's a D minus or whatever, almost yeah. an F. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not great. Um, I pre personally, I just didn't find much that I found was that great. And even the stuff I really liked from season two, which is almost purely the first half of the season, I kind of have a sour taste in my mouth when I actually think about those episodes now. Not to take away from them, like I did an episode rating and I still have episode four, I think, in my top five, and so do I do with episode two, but it definitely damper dampens a little bit. Whereas like episode two I thought was like could have been top two episodes uh, of the entire show. It wasn't as great. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. So let's let's kind of go away from that. Um, JC, I kind of want to hear like, what did you think were like the strengths of this season? Yeah, and we've kind of covered this before in the our finale stream for season two of House of the Dragon. I definitely would say that this season is a tale of two seasons. If you take episodes one through four by themselves in a vacuum without the context of, you know, how the later episodes kind of diminished it. Uh, the earlier parts of the season, I would say season two of House of the Dragon was fantastic. Um, you know, story-wise, narratively was fantastic. The cinematography, production, and acting, that's that's fantastic throughout all eight episodes. But in terms of like the writing by itself, the first four episodes, you know, barring a couple hiccups here and there, was great. From episode five onward, 
there definitely is a little bit of a, of a dip in quality. And then especially once we get to episode seven, that dip is pretty noticeable. So as far as strengths go, I would say uh, the story of the first four episodes in combination with the acting, cinematography, uh, the, the, the animation of the dragons is also just, you know, 10 out of 10. Those guys deserve all the rays, all the raises, all the applause in the world. That was pretty great. But story-wise, the first four episodes is the main strength of the season. Agreed. I think, like you mentioned, the production value of season two was, was really good. I mean, the costume design was great. The acting is yeah. great. I think the acting is still the biggest strength of the show. There aren't really any weak performances that I look at and go, yeah, this this person could have done better. Whereas, like, I think almost every other television show I've watched that I've actually, like, covered in depth in the last, like, couple of years, I've always been able to pick that out and be like, yeah, wasn't great acting here and there. House of the Dragon just doesn't have that issue. Like, even when characters aren't given things that I particularly like, the actors still give it their all. And so that's something that I really applaud House of the Dragon is their casting and their acting performances have been great. Uh, I think even sound design was really good in this season. Visuals, like you oh, mentioned, yeah. was great. I think they did a lot of... I think they really did a great job. I haven't talked <clears> about this a lot, and I, I do want to give them credit. I think they did a really good job of taking some of the, the storyline that was still there in season one and kind of paying that off in the beginning of season two. Like Some of that still kind of comes into fruition and in how they... You know, we got a little bit of Aegon, but you don't get a lot of him. Like the the character we are at right now with Aegon, because they have two different, basically, versions of Aegon or whatever. But um, I I think they did a good job of, of taking that. It's just when I think that this season needed to then create the next content, to create the next story going into the actual war is where they struggled. So I think there's a lot to like in terms of like Rook's rest. Uh, episode four, episode two was some really good yeah. character writing. Even episode one, I thought was was pretty good. I, I found episode one disappointing because of of being a book reader, and so I still like rate episode one pretty good. Still, I still have episode one as an eight out of ten, even though I wish it had gone a little further. And episode three, yeah. like even though it had like a bad moment to me at the very end of the episode, that even looks worse now that the actual season has come out. <clears throat> I think that episode three was like pretty good all the way up until like the ending. So like like you talked about, like it's so weird that I think the strength of the season is the first half and then the back half is just not as good. But yeah. I don't know. Do you do you agree with a lot of that? But yeah, no, you and I are of the same mind on this. Uh, episodes two through four, two and four are definitely the strongest episodes of this season. And even episodes one and three, despite you know, hiccups there at the end. Uh, episode three definitely had a hiccup. Episode one, I think, was just more of you yeah. and I had a preference for wanting to have Maelor Targaryen be a part of the show and, th and you know, comparing House of the Dragon to Fire and Blood, where Blood and Cheese actually had more of an impact in the source material than it kind of did yeah. here in the TV show. But despite those things, yeah, like 90 to 95% of those first four episodes was just stellar. And as you talked about earlier, yeah, especially what they did with the with some of the characters, you know, barring, you know, our main three characters aside, Aegon the second has so much more layers to him this season than he did, you know, in the previous season. He's Great. more, yeah, he's he's you know, he's obviously they they play up his 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 funniness for laughs, but you know, he he has more of a personality. Um, Kristen Cole. Oh my gosh, he goes through uh, a bit of a character arc here this season that I wasn't expecting him to. I mean, he's obviously still a piece of garbage, but uh, he's a piece of garbage that has a conscience. Yeah. So um, there, there's definitely strengths there in the character department as well, with, this, with the minor characters anyway. It's whenever we, wake, we get to the, the main three characters that, you know, yeah. stuff kind of starts to fall apart. It's so weird because even like reviewing this show, <clears throat> I defended this show, I would say, pretty much almost to the very end, like almost episode seven and eight. That's kind of when I was just like, okay, now you've lost me. Because like season one, I think, has the same issues of the first half of season two is like a lot of it is great quality, but then there's just they end a lot of episodes in like some questionable moments and it kind of maybe sours yeah. that episode when you like reflect on it. But then season two to like the second half did not start to have those same problems. It started to have other problems. Like it was like episode five as a whole. And we'll talk about this in the weakness is like you either buy into some of the plot lines that they're going with or you don't. And like 
you know, I did this with Ricky and we came out of that that episode in episode five with completely different opinions. He <laughs> he had completely agreed on stuff and I or he completely disagreed on some of the things they're doing and I completely agreed with maybe some of the stuff they're doing. So yeah. Yeah. I, I think one more thing I want to put in the strengths before we move on to kind of our weaknesses. I think they did a, a really good job of building out some of our more minor characters, like the dragon seeds. I think they gave all of those characters a lot of like time to kind of at least develop a little bit before they come into prominence. That's something Fire Emblem does not do at all. Like we don't get any oh, yeah. real knowledge of Hugh, Ulf, Adam, Alan, any of these characters until right when they're needed. So I, I give them credit of, of building those up. But um, yeah, JC, do you have any other strengths that you have before we move on to weaknesses? Yeah, no, and I just kind of want to reinforce what you were saying about, you know, our Dragon Seed characters in particular. Like, personally, from my own subjective perspective, I didn't like the character of Ulf, but that had more to do with, you know, my own, it's like, wow, this guy's just kind of an, an alcoholic douchebag. Like, what the heck? So unlikable. But I know that's what the show is going for. It's yep. like, oh, you know, no, no one on Team Black really likes him either anyway, as as well. So you're not the only one, JC. So... Like and so, to their credit, yes, they did give a lot of character to, you know, Hugh, Ulf, uh, Adam. Despite Adam not having too many scenes, you know, the scenes that he did have, he Adam made the most of it. Uh, the, Adam's actor made the most of it. Yeah. Adam's character made the most of those scenes. It was uh, very well done in terms of character and layers for those characters. Again, it's just the like the minor characters. I don't have a problem with. It's just yeah. the big three <laughs> i think like most of the minor characters they did pretty well with like i even saw a chart that came out about the screen time and it's so weird to me to think about like how little screen time some of the characters in season two got like Amon is this is like his main villain type arc of this season yeah and he had less than a hour an hour and a half or like no i'm trying to say this. he had less than a half an hour worth of screen time the whole season yeah that's that's wild. true like to me but <laughs> I don't yeah know. yeah that's true like Eamon I mean he ha he definitely had like a powerful presence but I think there was an episode I think it was episode five or six I don't remember where uh, I think he just has one scene where he's like you know pissed off at Rainier and he crumples up a piece of paper and throws it on the ground and I think that's all he does for the whole yep. that whole episode if I'm trying to rem I, I forget it's, which episode there's, it was there's exactly. a lot of episodes that like that though like episode two we see him have basically I think one or two scenes and they're not very long it's like he yeah. doesn't really start getting screen time until like episode three i think because that's like yeah he has because he has one like major scene in episode three and then episode four they start you know of course then he, yeah, so he starts to get going but like he still doesn't have a lot yeah. like, of being the main villain so okay let's yeah let's transition now into i guess the weaknesses because we're talking about some weaknesses here and I want to ask you, what are your main weaknesses of kind of the season as a whole? Yeah, I mean, uh, we'll get to character. I think we'll get to characters here in a bit. But as far as like uh, my main negatives with the writing of the season, I think there's two. Well, I guess technically three, but two of those three scenes are kind of tied together. But, uh, there's two slash three moments this season that I think are uh just kind of really big negatives for the season as a whole uh two of the three of them involve Alicent and Rhaenyra uh both in episode three and in episode eight not only is it a bit of a logical leap for me to believe that oh Rhaenyra is in King's Landing and how how is she not spotted I mean it, it took me out of the episode and on the same token you know Alicent being on Dragonstone I'm like how did no one on Dragonstone notice she was there I mean it's she wasn't even wearing you know, she wasn't really doing much to disguise herself. Like, it's like, oh, it's, it's Allison just out in the open. How did no one notice? Uh, but the the writing of those two characters kind of coming together, it just felt like a very, very shoehorned attempt by the producers to try to have these two characters still be this, the main spotlight for the season. And partially, I understand why they're doing it. It's because both of them are on the poster. It's, it's you know, Rainier versus Allison, you know, Team Green versus Team Black. You got to keep that theme going. But I don't know. It just felt very shoehorned to me. And we'll delve more into this once we start talking more specifically about these two characters. But Allison's character and Rainier's character in that finale moment, I just, I have so many problems. And then the, the other plot line slash third, third of the three plot lines that I didn't like 
was um Damon there at the very end uh prior I I like his, I I liked his character arc. I know a lot of people complained about oh he's spending too much time at Heron Hall. I liked what it was doing for his character. We all saw his char- the character journey he was going on, you know, little by little he was developing into someone that would eventually bend the knee to Rhaenyra. I just did not like that the catalyst for him eventually bending the knee to his queen wife was you know, him seeing Rhaenyra on the Iron Throne at the Weirwood Tree scene. It seemed very counterintuitive, not to, not just the themes of fire and blood, but very counter to the show's themes as well, where all of a sudden now we're supposed to buy into the fact that like, oh, Damon, Damon changed his mind because this prophecy is real. It's going to come true. It's a 100% guarantee. So might as well bend the knee as opposed to him coming to that decision on his own. But uh Again, I know I'm getting ahead of myself because we're talking no, about the characters good. specifically. Um, uh, what about you, Greece? I have a lot of weaknesses, but I'm going to try to keep this as brief as possible, given that we're going to talk about three plot lines like you talked about. But I just think they gave us a lot of screen time. Like, if you, again, referencing this chart I saw, I'll, pr- I'll probably oh, yeah. try to have it up in this in this video at, at multiple points, but... There are three characters that just have more screen time than most of everybody else in the show. And so if those three characters, if two of them don't work, let alone three of them don't work, this season's not going to work for you. So my problem was I instantly did not like the idea. The the whole premise of this season and the theme of this season, I did not like. I did not like the idea of the just Alicent and Rhaenyra like relationship uh, drama stuff with those two characters and I think it could have worked in this season and I've really thought about in the last week what they were going for and how I think it could have been done better I just think they undercut all of their tension with the two characters all of the drama with any of the characters because you have them meet up in episode three I think it could have worked so much better in episode eight if that just was not there if you remove episode three maybe it would have worked a lot better but yeah so I think that's part of it. I think Damon as a whole, to me, just he was good for so much of the season. But the problem is because the overall plot surrounding Damon is not moving much. Like if you take away Damon from the Riverland plot, nothing, not much changes. Like Oscar Tully is the one that brings all of the River Lords together. So when you kind of take you, you take a step back and you go, okay, what does Damon actually? mean for the Riverlands. It doesn't really mean much. So most of this season for Damon was just purely about his development as a character. And so yeah. that has to work for this to feel like putting investing all of this time into Heron Hall actually was worth it. That becomes a weakness when I, when some people like me do not buy into that. I think those are some weaknesses. I think they really struggled on the major characters. I think they struggled sometimes on execution, like having ideas, but then how do we execute those ideas? Like that, this is a good idea that we're, that we're having, but then how do we get there? So like, for instance, Jace, right? Jace is a character in episode seven and eight and his kind of transition to not liking dragon seeds because of them being bastards and how that maybe reflects upon him and a future Targaryen you know, crisis if Rhaenyra was to die. All of that is a wonderful idea. I think all of that makes sense. But I don't like the execution of how it just feels like it came out of nowhere. Like, there was no build-up to that from this entire season. It just springs out into episodes 7 and 8 for that builded tension and conflict that seemed to be lacking in the black side of things. Yeah. And that's where almost the, the whole root of my issues come from, because most of the, the only weakness I really have with this season is its writing. I think its writing is just very bad in a lot of a lot of areas. So, yeah, I don't know, JC, if you have any other weaknesses you want to talk about before we specifically dive into plot lines. This is yeah, time. yeah, yeah. Um, by the way, good points. I, I definitely agree with you on the whole Jace thing. I think we could have spent more time developing... I mean, we did spend, you know, sprinkles here and there in, yeah. in one of the earlier episodes with Jace having that conversation with Bela about him coming to the conclusion. It's not spoken, but he kind of starts coming to the conclusion that like, oh, I might actually be a strong boy, not a Targaryen. But for that to kind of lead to him essentially going off on his mother about like, what? How dare we use, you yeah. know, bastard born children as dragon riders? It did kind of come out of the blue. 
uh, but uh, to kind of get into the topic of other weaknesses, I will say that, I, and I specifically saw this a lot from non-book readers, and and I kind of saw it too. Uh, there was a lot of scenes in this season that was just dedicated to just kind of nothing going on. And I don't want to fault the writers. Well, I'm going to fault the writers, but at the same time, not fault the writers. Like they, they were trying to do the best with, and we're going to delve into this here in the next topic. Um, but they were trying to do the best with the eight episodes they were given. However, at the same time, I think they should have done better with the eight episodes they were given instead of dedicating screen time to, oh, look, Rain is at the Vale. Uh, cool, I guess. Thanks yep. for checking up on her. Oh, Allison's going for a swim. Uh, good on her, I guess. I don't know what this is doing for the episode. A lot of those scenes that take up, you know, time, screen time from particular episodes, I feel could have been better used you know, as you said, developing maybe Jace more as a character, developing him more to come to the conclusion that he eventually comes to, which is, you know, I hate, you know, that bastard born children are writing dragons instead of it coming out of the blue. Maybe build a little bit more uh, sexual tension between Mycaria and uh, Rhaenyra, because even though I didn't mind that scene, I do think yeah, probably could have done a little bit more to kind of, you know, make that not feel as out of the blue, that kiss. Or, or, uh, or even like, addressing it it's never addressed after it happens yeah so yeah yeah so just a lot of screen time that's dedicated to kind of pad it it seemed like the writers were trying to pad out the runtime to encompass the hour-long episodes that were that is i guess the requirement for this eight episode season and some of it just didn't well a lot of those added scenes did not work for me i think it's even more interesting because if you think about season one we didn't have any of those scenes. <coughs> season oh, one yeah. had the complete opposite issue. Season one, it was, there was just so much we need to get into these 10 episodes that every scene has to not only build a character, but has to move the plot forward. Yeah. So when you come off of season one, and I think this is going to be specifically, I think even for people that maybe watch season one right before watching season two, they, they didn't watch when season one dropped it's going to feel like such a drastic change in the way the storytelling is because you go from one season where, you know, you'll go from episode five to episode six and there's a ton of exposition that needs to happen. There's a ton of stuff going on, We're moving through these characters and plots rapidly. And then season two, like you talked about, we have a little bit of that. Okay. Some of these scenes can probably be removed. It feels like we don't yeah. really need them. Like we don't need to see Raina looking at burned skulls and stuff for like, three scenes in a row, like to get the point of what that's supposed to represent or yeah. Allison camping. Um, and I even get what they were trying to go with the Allison stuff, but it just wasn't needed. Like we already got that idea of what was going on. Like we've, we've seen enough to yeah. understand where Allison is. It feels like it's just Allison's one of the major three. So we have to make sure we at least give her a number of scenes. I don't know, which is which is just crazy to me. Given like Allison in that episode has more scenes than probably most minor characters do on average each episode, and that was by far her like plot that went nowhere really. So yeah, that is crazy. But you kind of um, already introduced this topic a little bit, but I want to ask you like I am very conflicted on how I feel because it's come out that HBO specifically cut two episodes from season two. And this was done like right before writing was supposed to be over for the season. And so I haven't really seen this clarified yet, but I want to ask you, JC, what do you think your thoughts are? Like, have, did they really just have the eight episodes that they had already written out and then we just got those eight episodes? Or did they go back through and try to fit in other stuff with those eight episodes? Or like the stuff they wrote out for episode nine and ten, is that just going to be in the next season? I'm very interested to see like what you think about that. Yeah, yeah. So for you viewers at home, uh, recently it came out, uh, Elio, who's one of the writers for The World of Ice and Fire, him, Linda, and George R. R. Martin wrote The World of Ice and Fire, which is what 60% of Fire and Blood is. Uh, Elio specified that uh, during the writing process for House of the Dragon Season 2, Ryan Condell and his writing team originally wrote 10 individual scripts that would encompass this Season 2 of the TV show. However, somewhere along the writing process, uh, 
David Zasloff, the CEO of Warner Brothers, uh, announced that like, oh, we're buying out Discovery. There was this merger that was going on between Warner Brothers and Discovery. Hence why HBO Max streaming service is no longer HBO Max. Now it's just Max. And so during this merger, there were a lot of uh, budget cuts going around, a lot of cost cutting going around. And one of the cost cutting measures uh, kind of filtered down to House of the Dragon, which was, hey, House of the Dragon writers, I know you wrote these 10 scripts. However, we can really, we only have the budget to film eight. And so then the writing team had to scramble. And, and again, this is per Elio from Elio and Linda. So again, this is, uh, this is per his testimony. I, I, I haven't heard anyone else verify this, but per Elio, the writing team then had to scramble and say like, oh crap, like what are we going to do? You know, 10 episodes down to eight. So the prevailing theory was that like episodes nine and 10 would encompass a battle coming up, which uh, I, I don't want to spoil it fully, but if you're, if you're someone who hasn't read the book, but has only watched the TV show, I'm pretty sure you know which battle it is that's coming up pretty soon. But there's a big battle that was coming up that I think was going to take place in either episode nine or 10 that had to be removed from the season and pushed back to the beginning of season three because of this. And in addition to this, there were a lot of other plot lines that were originally going to finish season two that had to also either inevitably be kind of rewritten to take place in episode eight or were going to be pushed back to, to the beginning of season three. However, while this whole rewriting stuff was going on, the writer's strike happened. And so a lot of this messy writing that we're seeing here close to the, that we saw close to the end of season two had to do with the fact that the writers did not have enough time to come back from the writer's strike, clean up the clean up the scripts prior to them filming, because by the time the writer's strike was already underway, filming began for House of the Dragon season two. So the filmmakers and directors were like, hey, we got these eight scripts. It's getting kind of these last two episodes are kind of hairy. So we'll do the best we have given these scripts that we have on hand. But um Sorry for this long-winded answer. Oh, no, you're Bruce. good. Uh, you're just, I, I'm glad you explained it more because even I didn't specifically get exactly where this information came from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to your point, Greece, I, my personal subjective opinion is that I feel for the writers in this situation. I'm like, wow, like HBO, David Zaslav, Warner Brothers, they're complete, you know, greedy jerk holes. They did this and they inevitably ruined what could have been a much better House of the Dragon season two. However, at the same time, it was not David Zaslov's decision to tell the Ryan Condon and his writing team, hey, we need more scenes of uh, Reyna at the Vale. It was not David Zaslov's decision to tell, to tell Ryan Condon, hey, you know, we really could use this pivotal scene of, of Alicent, you know, doing some backstrokes in the water. Uh, a lot of these filler moments, or, or obviously, you know, hey, you know what, writing team? We we don't have the budget for ten episodes, but you know what would be really cool? What if we add this uh, really important, you know, scene of Daenerys's back and three baby dragons? Oh man, that's such a great scene. You should add that in that. Like that was not a David Zaslav decision. That was yep. a Ryan Condal writing team decision. So while I feel for the writers for having to do the best they could with uh, with the eight episode format that they didn't plan on having, I do fault the writers for the narrative decisions they made in closing out the season and some of the narrative decisions they made for some of the characters here. That's kind of where I'm at. Like I give them a little sympathy because I, I get it. You know, you write out this whole season and you expect it's going to go a certain way, right? You right. expect that because of all the buildups in the episodes after episode four, you're going to eventually have a battle happen. Right, that's that's where episode eight kind of ends up. That's why so many people have a problem with it because it feels like, wait, aren't we in the same place as we were at the end of season one? It seems like war is starting. Okay, well, so you have a montage thing at the end, which is really cool. It has a great score. It's awesome to see all the oh, actions yeah. to really show the scope of the world. But it feels like, wait, that's where we're ending the season. So it does. Fe it has that feeling that okay, the season doesn't feel concluded. It like if you even think about like. I would even go as far as, like, if you look at almost every Game of Thrones season ending, even all the way up into the later seasons, regardless of how good or bad they were, they at least felt concluded for that season, whatever they were trying to do, whether you liked it, you didn't like it, at least was, like, a conclusion yeah. to it. This didn't feel like a conclusion for majority of the characters, outside of, like, maybe Damon. Damon's the only character where I'm like, 
I feel like that was actually a natural endpoint of where his arc was going, so... Yeah. But, getting back to the point, though... My issue is, though, they had all of these ten episodes written out. And you knew the battle was going to happen in either episode nine or episode ten. So most of these plots weren't going to go any further anyway. Like, because it would have gone into the battle, right? So my question is, like, in those original eight episodes, did any, like, what, what actually changed? Like, what drastically changed in terms of, like, okay, we needed to do this instead of that? Like, was the Rhaenyra Allison thing supposed to happen in episode 10 or something like that? I just have so many questions because regardless of, you know, the writing and all that, and I, I agree, if they had been given more time to write the season, to make revises, have more of a complete picture of those 10 episodes, I think the season would have been slightly better for me. I don't think it would have just made it instantly, oh, okay, everything's fine, because their entire vision for this season to me just seems to be wrong. Like, that's not how I would have yeah. done it. I don't think they executed it well. I think they made some very jarring choices with characters. So, I don't know. I give them some sympathy, but I don't give them a lot. I, I don't know if you agree with that or not, but... Yeah, yeah, no, I I completely agree with you. You know, and even you know, if you look at Game of Thrones, you know, like let's take season one as an example. You know, it has a clear arc. You know, at the very beginning, Ned Stark, family man, is trying to discover what's going on uh, at King's Landing, and then end of season, he's killed off, and Joffrey is king. There's like a clear yep. kind of arc going on. Same with season two. You know, episode one, we're introduced to Stannis Baratheon. Holy crap, he's coming to King's Landing. What are we gonna do? And then obviously that leads into, you know, episode nine, which is Blackwater Bay. And then the episode 10, the aftermath of Blackwater Bay, where Stannis has has effectively lost that battle and is back on dragon. So I'm like, there's a clear arc going on. Yeah, but even, J here in dude, even JC, just let me say there for a second. Like, not only are those like the main plot, like concluded, it feels like there's a natural endpoint to every like major character, not just yeah. that. And that's what I think is even lacking even more in House of the Dragon season. Yeah, yeah. So to your point, you could say that, yeah, like Damon has a character arc this season, but all these other characters, like, did they really have an arc at all? Like, yep. uh, Krieg and Stark, we were introduced to him in episode one, and then he just disappears. I don't think we don't see him again. No, and uh, there was supposed to be a scene that he was in, which would have kind of made sense. It would have felt like, okay, you know, because he was apparently cut from the march we see where the, the, the Starks their Stark forces are crossing. Oh, okay, okay. He was supposed to be in that. He, he was supposed to be actually in there. And they cut that for some reason. I don't know if they're, you know, maybe second guessing making Regan Stark part of this plot earlier than in the book or what. But I do think that would have been a good change. And it would have, like, made sense as to why you put him in the very beginning of the episode. And then you never see him again. But, yeah, continue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it, basically what I'm saying is that outside of Damon, there's not really a good character arc for anyone else throughout this season. There's nothing here that feels like, okay, we started here on episode one, and then we concluded here on episode, well, episode eight in this instance, but the last episode of the season. There's Outside of Damon, there's no one else I can really say that for. Um, it just felt like a incomplete season for a lot of characters. Agreed. And... Yeah, I think that's just that's that's the whole thing. And I, I see and the reason I, I wanted to make a big point of this is because I see a lot of people um, that are giving the season a lot of leeway and almost a free pass because of kind of the writing issues, it seems like that were going on because of the cut to episodes. And I, I try to push back on that a little bit because I don't think that's the whole story. I think that's it's a part of it, right? There's all it's always going to be a part of it. Right? I think. If they had more time, you know, maybe we could have seen this season feel a bit better. And for me, maybe I wouldn't have felt like the season was like a 6 out of 10. Maybe I would have felt like it was a 7 out of 10. Or maybe it was like in between a 7 and an 8. But it, I don't think them having two more episodes would have changed my thoughts on this being like a pretty disappointing season. I mean, unless the battle coming up is just fantastically done. And it concludes all the other characters so much better that I kind of overlook the two I dislike what they did in the season yeah. but I don't know I feel like we're kind of going in circles so let's kind of go through I think the main three plot lines we've talked about them I think a little bit but um, yeah, JC I'll ask just because you kind of started on this when we talked about the weaknesses like mm -hmm. what did you think of overall like Rhaenyra and Allison's plot lines as they are the main 
kind of two of the season. Yeah, no, and um, and, and kind of bouncing, I was kind of delving back a little bit into what you just discussed pre- here in the previous plot point. Uh, the Alice and Turner scenes, despite the two episodes cut, I think Ryan Condell and his writing team still intended to have Alice and Rhaenyra kind of meet in these, in my opinion, forced scenes in both episode three and episode eight. I think the only difference would have been if it would, if we would have had a 10 episode season, it would have happened at episode 10 and it still would have been, it, it still would have had the same writing issues. Like getting cut two episodes didn't change that. Uh, but to discuss the characters of Rainier and Alicent as a whole and their plot lines, I, you know, outside of, again, it being a little bit of an illogical leap that both of them are, that Rainier was at King's Landing and no one got, no one caught her, and that Alicent was at Dragonstone and no one caught her, it just seemed like a very weird season for both these characters. Rainier, she doesn't really do much this season until episode seven when she kind of takes over uh the dragon seed plot line which was originally jace's idea on fire and blood but they gave it to rainier just to have her character do a little bit more yeah. this season than what she was than 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 what she was doing previous to this episode seven so she had a little bit more going on for her but uh she definitely is uh definitely i wouldn't say evil but uh she she definitely got a lot of people killed there during the dragon seed scene and you just hear this heroic music playing in the background as Rainier is like smiling, like, ah, yes, we finally found our Hugh Hammer. And I'm thinking to myself, like, oh, you know, aren't you sad and upset about all those innocent people that got burned and eaten by a, by a dragon? I guess not. But then the TV show still seems to think you're the good guy because there's this heroic music playing in the background. Um, so there's just a disconnect here with her character. Alicent, on the other hand, oh my gosh, like, her her character, I don't... I mean, obviously, both Rainier and Allison don't really do much during this part of Fire and Blood, but if they were going to give them something, I feel like they should have given them, both of these characters, something that would have been more in line with their character. Allison, she loves her children. In season one, when Amond got his uh, eye slashed, she immediately grabbed, her ni- grabbed a knife and was, like, wanting to defend her kids. Now, all of a sudden, she's like, at episode eight, she's like, oh, yeah, Rhaenyra, yeah, you should totally come to King's Landing and, and kill Aemon and, and kill Aegon while you're there. And it was like, what? Do you not care about your children? Uh, and, and then also this whole thing with uh, Jaehaerys Targaryen, who died at blood and died during the first episode during the blood and cheese incident. She didn't mourn him whatsoever. She was like, oh, you know, Jaehaerys who? Ah, no, I'm just really sad that that the Green Council doesn't love me. They don't value my opinion. I'm just really sad, Mopey Alice. Please, please feel sad for me. And it's like, I mean, yeah, I mean, we feel sad for you, but not for that crap. We feel sad for you because of what happened with Jaehaerys, but you don't even seem to be mourning Jaehaerys. Instead, you want your other children to die. Or, you know, you're not mourning the, 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 the life of your grandson, but you want your children. It's just, there's a very clear character disconnect with, with Allison and it just, it did not work for me. I agree. I see. I'm of the <clears throat> mind of thinking where, you know, two of the three plot lines to me were completely butchered in this season. Rhaenyra to me is still salvageable because I don't think they did anything too bad in this season that I was like, mm, I don't know about that decision with the character. Yeah. But, Rhaenyra to me, to me is the biggest disappointment of the season because the character just didn't grow at all. Like this character from episode one is almost the same character in episode eight, barring the thing from episode seven. But I almost view that as a lesser version of Rainey's in season one. It's like some action that happens, but you don't really understand why it happens because there's heroic music playing. Nobody seems to question Rhaenyra on her actions afterwards. The show still paints Rhaenyra as the good guy. So you oh, yeah. have, like, in my opinion, an, an illogical writing moment that paints Rhaenyra in a bad way that should happen, but it's not given any real consequence. It's not painted in a like dark light or anything. It's not like they're trying to lean into Rhaenyra being maybe a bad guy or anything like that. So, I don't know. And this is where I'm, like conflicted because I think Rhaenyra, if she had two more episodes would have been a better character of this season. We could have had more of an arc for the character, but given where it stands at, the character just was very stagnant, I think was 
the vast majority of the season was not entertaining or just interesting to watch at all. Yeah. And that leads me to Allison. So Allison, it's so weird to me because I'm so conflicted about Allison because I think the overall vision that they had in their head, that Ryan Connell and his team had in their head, I think could have been good for this. But they just went about it in the wrong way. They, 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 they wanted to make Allison become more depressed and boxed in and you know losing a lot of things and wanting to be out of the war and i completely understand that i think that's actually a natural like i I made an allison video for the week that this video is coming out and i talk about the end point of where allison is where she wants to be you know free because even going back to season one that's something that she wanted to be she was always boxed in being forced to do all these things marrying viserys and you know having all these children at such a young age not being able to, to marry who she wants he is just jealous of Rhaenyra because Rhaenyra is that opposite person. Rhaenyra doesn't follow the rules like Allison was forced to do and all those things. So that endpoint for the character actually does make sense. And the idea of her wanting to be out of the war because of all of her guilt and things that, you know, she might have done and things like that during the war, all that makes sense. But the way they went about it just didn't. Because the thing that seems like the tipping point, like you talked about, of Allison's whole character arc that makes her kind of shut down going on this camping trip and stuff like that, where it's said that by the showrunners that this was, you know, her trying to commit suicide or at least was like some sort of thought of maybe doing so. It comes right after she just loses power. And so it comes off as very just like, okay, well, she's just kind of power hungry. She's kind of selfish. It's not like none of these things are triggered by the loss of Jaehaerys. That isn't even, that's irrelevant. And that's why, that's why I said at the beginning of this, like, review is like seeing some things that happen in episode one that are super impactful and should have ramifications never pop up again like Rhaenyra straight up says a son for a son and Allison just forgets Jaehaerys was alive at some point I guess and died and so Allison you have this this whole season where I think there's two problems with it one I think the actual execution of why she starts to become like withdrawn from the war is kind of flawed and makes us not really sympathize with the character at all. And then the other part of it is the thing that actually, you know, with her meeting with Rhaenyra, how she's actually going to achieve freedom in those things is just, she's going to sell out her whole family. And that just goes against, I think, everything that they've built Allison to be in this, this series. Like, I understand Aemond, right? Aemond is obviously somebody that has to go for Allison to have any type of chance of having any type of freedom. Like, he's just somebody that has shown now, regardless of what you think of Aemond's character, he just burnt uh, an entire, like, town to the ground. He is somebody that's not going to surrender any of that stuff. And in this season, her, or Allison and Aemond are the furthest apart in terms of where they are. But to say that she's willing to give up Aegon, who they literally take a number of scenes of showing Aegon in his his bed, basically injured, and Allison's there with him. And they show that Allison has an interest in her son, Aaron, and how he's actually become a good man. Well, he's still going to have to be killed for Rhaenyra to take the throne. He has a dragon. He poses another claim against Rhaenyra. And then you have her father, who she still has a good relationship, at least that's what we've kind of shown. He has Kristen Cole, who he's in a relationship and even says to Rhaenyra is basically her lover. More, He has her brother. Like, I just, I can't rationalize how it came to that point. And, and all you have to do to simply fix what they did, and this is the most frustrating part of, I think, the entire thing, is that it could have easily have been achieved if they just changed some things around a little bit. It's just have her go, oh, the book route. It's, okay, Rhaenyra. You can be the queen of this part of the kingdom and, and let Aegon be this so we can end this war, the tragedy it's caused both sides. And then you have a natural reaction from Rhaenyra where it's like, well, you know, now that I seem like I'm, I'm winning, I have the power, now, now you want to do this stuff? That's oh, yeah. exactly how you'd have done it. And so, JC, I think to me, I don't know if you feel this way as well, it's just the frustrating thing is they had such interesting ideas, but just simple execution didn't work. Yeah. No, no, I completely agree with you on all those, on uh, the three points that you covered. One, that conversation that with Allison, between Allison and Rainier should have been different. It should have been Allison offering up half the kingdom as opposed to agreeing with Rainier for Rainier to take the whole kingdom. I think it would have made more sense, uh, not just because it happens in the book la- later on in the book, but because for 
both the characters of Rainier and Alicent, I think it would have made, I think this conversation would have felt more natural. And then Rainier obviously would have said, heck no, I'm going to take the whole thing. And I think it would have also made sense for her character, especially given where her character is currently on her, currently in her journey in, in House of the Dragon. The second point you made, which is, you know, again, touching on how this season didn't feel as, as a complete circle, as a complete character arc for either character, you start the season with, you know, blood and cheese, this, even though not as horrific as fire and blood, a still horrific event where Allison loses her child and, you know, she was sleeping with Kristen Cole. And I think it would have been more, I think it would have been po more poetic if we would have finished the season with Allison just kind of uh, not in this happy place of like, oh, I'm free, but rather reflecting on everything yeah. that has happened over the season. You know, I've lost my grandson. You know, I, I took a lover for just because I'm depressed. You know, her thinking on all the things she's done this season and reflecting in a more somber, depressing light. Instead, she's like, oh, I'm finally free. Everything's happy. It, it's, it doesn't make any sense. And, and your third point where like, yeah, like Alicent really loved, she felt concerned for Aegon when Aegon came back to King's Landing you know, injured, burned, and everything, Alicent showed that she had a genuine concern for her son. She had a genuine concern for her other son, who's currently in the Reach, Daron Targaryen. She still, you can tell she still cares for her brother, Gwen. There, there, and, and even partially, she, she also kind of cares a little bit there for, for Kristen Cole. And obviously she cares for Helena. So like all, for her to, you know, in episode five and even episode six, where she has a genuine concern for these characters to all of a sudden episode eight, tell Rainier, it's like, oh yeah, kill them all. doesn't matter. Yeah. I, yeah, I just want peace. It's like, who, who flipped the switch here? How did that come to be for Alicent? Agreed. And even if you want to just say that, okay, maybe Allison doesn't think <clears throat> Rainier is going to kill all those other people. <clears throat> if that is the case, then you also just say that Allison's just dumb. She just doesn't understand what's going on. And I also think that's a breaking of the character, too. Allison's never been shown to be stupid, really. She's been somebody that seems to be fairly intelligent. So, I don't know. There's a lot of issues, I think, with the focus of those two characters. And if you were going to make that the focus of the season, it needed to be strong. And it just wasn't. And I didn't even touch on, really, episode three, how that undercuts episode eight as well. But, yeah, I a lot of issues with that, but... Let's move on to kind of the last major plot line of the season and our thoughts on that. And JC, I'll let you go first, but uh, what are your thoughts on more or less Damon's whole plot line? Yeah, and uh, we covered this in our uh, season uh, episode eight uh, discussion, but uh, basically I, I, I liked most of Damon's character arc. It was really just this one scene at the Weirwood Tree where Damon has this vision of you know a lot of random things about game of thrones season eight which is a conversation for another time but the most important thing here is that he sees a vision of rhaenyra on the iron throne and that is the catalyst for convincing daemon to bend the knee to his queen wife not a decision that he came to on his own and it just cheapens his character so much i would have much preferred i mean i get that they wanted to have that scene there for fan service for like you know, show watchers to be like, oh, like White Walkers, I remember that. Oh, Green Men, Children of the Forest. Oh, that remind that's like the books. Uh, you know, for them to get nostalgia tears for for seeing Daenerys. Uh, but I, I mean, it's fine if they wanted to do that, whatever. But the the catalyst here that oh, him seeing Rhaenyra on the Iron Throne is what convinces him to to finally bend the knee because oh, it's definitely going to happen. It's a one hundred percent probability that this is going to happen. Well, I can't fight fate. I might as well just give in to the winning side and support Rhaenyra. It's just like, it cheapens his character arc so much. He was already on his way to bending the knee to Rhaenyra. I think it would have been just more impactful if he made that decision on his own, bent the knee to Rhaenyra, and then afterward you can do all this vision stuff about like, ah, you were right, Damon. You were right to bend the knee to Rhaenyra because she's going to wind up on the throne anyway. That would have meant more. I, as is, I was not a fan. I agree, and I think Damon, to me, is... I, I've talked about this at length. It's the reason I did the Damon video on his character in Season 2 before Allison's. I also have found that I think more people buy into Damon's arc than they do Allison's, which I kind of find surprising because I think Damon's is more blatant. It's just right there. But let me get to the meat of, of the issue. I think it's so frustrating because you can have Damon's arc 
completely play out the exact same way. Even put the vision in there too. That's fine. You know, I still wouldn't have been a huge fan because of Helena and all that stuff in it, but uh -oh. you can still have it play out the exact same. But you have one different change. Either in episode seven or episode eight, you had two chances. You have two chances to give Damon some sort of okay moment where he's starting to realize, okay, what he's doing is maybe wrong and he needs to go about doing things better. That's what all these visions have been about. And so either in episode seven, you could have had him, you know, taking the, the role and saying, yeah, Willem, uh, Bracken, or not Bracken, Blackwood needed to be killed. Because of the actions that he did, he took it a step too far, and he was, you know, Dane was kind of partly responsible for that. And so he, he, out of his own choice, decides to kill Willem Blackwood. But the way season, or season or episode 7 does it is they have it where Oscar totally forces him to do it. It's not something that Damon consciously steps up and does. That's not his action. He's forced into an action that's different than character development. And also being bossed around by a 12-year-old didn't help. I think that scene, I think that whole episode still functions, though. If, episode 8, he finally realizes, okay, Alfred Broom comes up and he's like, okay, you know, should, you should be king, right? Not Rhaenyra. She, she's just incompetent. She can't do it. And then Damon at this point, finally realizes, okay, no, I'm not going to do that. He denies that. Maybe he threatens Broom. Maybe he you know, kills him, whatever you want to do. Okay, have it some sort of moment where, before we get this visions... Damon has a change of character. He has some development in which all of these visions throughout the entire thing have some sort of payoff to it. And then you can do the visions, like, like you talked about, JC. Then you have the visions for whatever, the fan service, or just showing people stuff like Daenerys or whatnot. Still wouldn't have been a huge fan because I think the Helena stuff kind of breaks continuity, but whatever. We're not going to talk about it. It's, that wouldn't have been that major of a detail if Damon was already redeemed. We wouldn't be harping on it as much. It would have been like, Okay, wasn't a huge fan of that, but I get why I was there. But then you have it where Damon is basically locked into fate. It's the exact same thing of episode seven, where Damon is forced to do something. It's not his own character that is saying, okay, I need to step up and do this thing. It's him being backed into an option. Damon is realizing, oh, I, I can't fight for the throne. I can't be king if I see Rhaenyra is on the throne, and this is my role. That's what Helena is saying and all this stuff. Like, yeah. You just took any type of action from the character and you gave it to things like fate and him being backed into a corner and being forced to do something. And so it, this is the frustrating part about season two is if you fix this, all it takes is you fix one scene. You don't change anything else in the entire season. Just change one scene where Damon reacts differently to something and this isn't as big of a deal. With Alicent, you change a couple things. Boom, Allison works. Maybe she's still not great in the season, but she she's not as polarizingly bad for someone like me. It's like, okay, I can see where you were going. I thought it was okay. Maybe it wasn't as, as great as it could have been, but fine. Then, instead of me saying, okay, well, this season character assassinated two of my favorite characters, then I'd be like, okay, well, this season did some, some cool things. I, you know, it wasn't exactly with the book, but I, I get the vision. That, to me, is the most frustrating part about season two, is it's just simple things that could have been fixed, and it just... You know, trying to understand the writing process of the, of the two characters and how they are written this way, it's just, it blows my mind. Because I don't know how, because they talked about, um, in that same source, that apparently like the script had been revised four to five times. I don't know how you look at this script. I don't know when, at what point, they decided Damon's plot was going to end the way it did. But it, there's no way you read through this multiple times with a room full of writers and not, and nobody, like... Goes though, you know, guys, this kind of defies basic writing. Like, I, I don't. Yeah. I don't know, JC. <laughs> Just frustrating to me. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, maybe not the best uh, metaphor here, but it's as if you, it's like the Red Wedding. It's like, oh, what if prior to the Red Wedding, maybe like at the very beginning of Storm of Swords, uh, Rob was informed that, like, oh, Walder Frey is going to kill you at this secret wedding between Edmure and you know, uh, and his, and his daughter, it's like, you shouldn't go to the wedding. Cause this is definitely going to happen. And then he's like, ah, yes, it's, it's already a prophecy. I got it. Uh, well, yeah, I got to do it. <laughs> it's like, okay, maybe not the best example, but it would be, it's essentially ruining the surprise before the reveal happens. So it's like, oh, Rainier is on the iron throne. Here's the answer. And then Damon is like taking this into kind of it's like, oh, okay, well, that's the answer. Uh, it's part of fate. Can't fight fate. All right. 
gonna gonna join up then i i don't know and to your point yes i think out of the the big three main characters here i think damon's would have been probably the easiest to fix but it's probably the one that felt the like it would have been the easiest to fix because all you have to do is really switch around two scenes and that's it yep. and it and it would have done so much more for his character arc but instead because of the order that these scenes happen in his character is honestly probably the most ruined of the three so i, I agree i yeah i i don't know i'm not i'm not a big fan i i really do think they they did his character an injustice here and i mean he's not he's not ruined i mean he's definitely on team rainier team black now like he's 100 percent on 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 his wife's side but it would have just it, it, it cheapened his character so much it would have meant so much more had he come to this decision on his own i agree and it's so annoying because it's <clears> like <throat> season one went a certain way with the character <clears throat> which i wasn't a huge fan of season one for damon specifically because <clears throat> he was just kind of a villain uh I, I some people seem to debate me on this and I, I don't know how you debate it i mean there's not really much redeeming about damon outside of his just he has a love for his brother that's it i mean that's that's his one character he, he's not a good father not a good husband he it's quite the opposite i mean he grooms rainier in season one he kills multiple innocent people uh he's just not a good character in his opinion like if you want to say he's a good villain fair as a book reader i there's a reason Damon is George's favorite character, and he was not that in season one. But then season two comes around, and I was like, okay, wait. Okay, I can actually understand why they did those things with season one. So it actually was making season one look even better. So I was like, okay, I get this. Now Now I understand why they did Damon, because they wanted him to be, you know, have all these really negative things, and they were going to build down to that. They weren't going to make him a good character, like like a, you know, somebody that's a fully redeemed character, but like he was going to have more nuance to him, where, where it's like he's rethinking some of those things, and then you just screw it up and it's like it's it's that part of it because it's like I had the hope this actual season was basically going to fix him in season one ah <sighs> but yeah i don't know I, it's it's sad it's sad but let's move on let's move on jason okay I feel like we're going in circles on Damon, but uh, i want to hear like so what are your thoughts or expectations going into season three and i guess beyond given that we know they're going to be eight episodes i know you're doing in the works of a video that that's very much linked to this idea so i just want to hear your thoughts on like your expectations thoughts going into season three yeah i have a. Uh, so after uh the season two finale aired uh, ryan condell con well he kind of confirmed kind of didn't he didn't specify but he said that the following seasons would have the same cadence as season two which is to assume that, like, okay, we are to assume that season three will also have only eight episodes, similar to how season two only had eight episodes. And on top of that, more importantly, he also con con confirmed that House of the Dragon will only be four seasons. And if that is the case, I have no idea how they're going to wrap the show up in four seasons, especially if they go at the pace that they went this season. It just seems like there's going to be a lot of compromises that they're going to have to do within the source material to get it down to four seasons, or they're going to change a lot that they didn't intend to change i i just i don't know uh as far as season three goes and the events that i think will take place in season three i don't think all is lost again to reiterate i think as a television show you know removing my desire removing my love for fire and blood even removing some of the plot holes which are still prevalent here in season two i think season two was still a decent season of tv and i still am looking forward to seeing what they come up for with season three because there's a lot of good stuff here in the fire and blood book that i i have maybe uh maybe delusionally so but i have some sort of delusional faith that like okay they'll even though I, the context around the next couple of scenes might not be exactly how i like it to be I know that the writers will try to do justice to what they think these scenes should be like, you know, the upcoming battles, the upcoming moments that are still to come, and even the upcoming character arcs, you know, obviously, Greece, you and I were both disappointed with Rhaenyra's character arc this season, but I, I have faith that the writing team will follow through on what Rhaenyra's character arc needs to be this upcoming season for House of the Dragon to be the interesting show it needs to be. I have faith that I, well, again, maybe potentially blind faith, but I, I have some faith that they have an idea of what needs to happen here. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it, but I'm definitely not as excited for this upcoming season as I was for, you know, season two, you know, coming from season one, going into season two. 
Yeah, I, I think I'm a bit more negative. I because season one they basically rebought my faith and trust, and so House of the Dragon season two, I was like not worried about the season at all. I, I thought we were going to be have a good season. Season two should have been way easier than season was one was to do, and so they lost my faith. Uh, part of that is because they butchered two of my favorite characters in yeah. the source material. Now that doesn't and again that doesn't apply to you. I'm not saying that oh they didn't adapt to those characters that well. I'm talking about in terms of just the show continuity. I'd already accepted right. that they were different characters. I actually like in season 1 liked Allison better in the show than I did the book. I thought Allison was the second best character of season. And so they've kind of broken those characters for me so no, like almost no matter what those characters do for the rest of the show, I will struggle to understand their motivations because they're just completely fractured now at this point. I, do, I think they are beyond repair. And so Rhaenyra, I think, is not there yet. I think Rhaenyra, to me, I think I, it will really impact in the first four episodes how I view Rhaenyra of the next season. Because that will be a pivotal moment <coughs> where if some things do not start happening with the character and she stays very stagnant as she has, then that's where it's like, okay, well, this character almost is gone as well, but I don't know, like, I'm still going to cover season three, but I'm more of so now they have to regain my trust. I'm now on, like, yeah. I don't, I have very low expectations for what I'm going to get in season three based upon we have 16 episodes to conclude the rest of this story, and I don't know how that's going to happen in a satisfactory way. And, like, to yeah. your point, I do think, like, as a television show on a standalone, like, I still think it's, like, a, you know, very at least okay product based upon just how good the production is. But yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty worried about this show and even like future Game of Thrones projects, which kind of leads us into our next topic. Like outside of House of the Dragon, JC, like does this impact how you view like future Game of Thrones related projects? Oh, definitely. It definitely does. And uh, real quick before we hop into this uh, point, I just I just want to uh, add to your point yeah, here. Go ahead. I, I think a lot of people who are exclusively show watchers and haven't read the book, I think they look at you know YouTubers who have read Fire and Blood, who have read the A Song of Ice and Fire series, and watch these shows. Obviously, we're more critical on these shows than someone who hasn't read the books, and so they look at it and they're, they they look at us and they're like, "Oh, you guys are just being negative because it doesn't match exactly what happened in the book." Both you and I are aware that there's going to be changes yep. to the book. Like we're not disappointed by the fact that they're that they're changing the continuity. Of course, we might be a little disappointed. It's like, oh, you know, probably in the book it was better, like blood and cheese. But we're not like it's not a make or break make or break for us. Yep. For us, what is a make or break is when within the show's own continuity, the logic that the show has built up over the course of the previous episodes, they dramatically change something for either a character or a storyline that wasn't previously explained or wasn't previously acknowledge and then all of a sudden it's like oh just this character is like this now all of a sudden for no apparent reason that's what you and i have a problem with yeah. not the fact that it doesn't match you know 100 percent to the book yeah I, we've uh, talked about this at length like changes had to be made to fire and blood there's no yeah. way you can do the story without making changes here and there that's never been the problem my my problem has been when they've changed stuff from the book it's already in the book and they do it in a worse manner that's damaging to their own story it's like you yeah, have a blueprint yeah. for how to do something. You obviously chose not to do that, and then you made it worse. So, yeah. <laughs> well, like if they change it to something better, that's great. If yeah. they change it to something yeah. worse, then it's like, oh, well. Yeah. Um, but any, anyway, to, to answer your original question about does this kind of dampen my excitement for future Game of Thrones related projects? I think it does. Uh, I'm not as excited for the Hedge Knight TV show that's coming up in early 2025 as maybe I would have been previously had I not watched House of the Dragon season two. I think the catalyst for this again is just that I feel, I, I don't know. I, I, I've heard that this is going to be this, a, a similar writing team to House of the Dragon. I just feel that they're going to really try to shoehorn in a lot of the, you know, the winter is coming, White Walkers, the others, you know, connections to the last couple of seasons of Game of Thrones. And I'm just not a fan of it. I think a TV show should stand on its own two feet without having to rely on fan service from those other projects to kind of, you know, get the audience excited and be like, oh, look, that's that's Daenerys. Oh, that reminds me of Game of Thrones. Oh, this is a great show now. It's like, no, like the show should be about the characters 
of that show, not reliant on, again, fan service from previous material. So that, in combination with just seeing what they kind of did to some of the characters here in the second season of Fire and Blood, or, or House of the Dragon, just kind of leaves me a little a little worried to see what they're going to do with, uh, even though we have a significantly smaller cast here, it's just, you know, we have our two main characters, Dunk and Egg, and then a uh, revolving door of other characters here. I'm still a little a little worried about any uh, any uh, potential damages that they might do to some of these characters here. But but what about you, Grease? So I just want to like put a question out to the audience based upon kind of what you talked about. <clears throat> My thing is, I they keep doing this thing with the White Walkers and referencing Game of Thrones season eight or Game of Thrones is the television show as a whole. I don't know who they're targeting that at. I have never seen anybody in my chats or any people that, you know, have answered my polls or anything like that in my community or even people that I know in real life that have liked that stuff. And so I don't know if there are people that like just seeing the, the white walkers and the connection to game of Thrones. I like, I think even people that like the show, some of the, like, even if they buy into like Alice and they, and they buy into Dame, like one of the things they, I've always heard people that are positive about the show is they like, they don't like that connect white walkers stuff. So yeah, I really don't know. If that's in Dunkin' Egg, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, Dunkin' Egg is a story that is not about that. It's it's about, you know, this this it's about really showing kind of the average or person in Westeros. Right? It's about somebody that's not highborn. It's about somebody that's trying to make their way in this world and kind of the struggles of that and kind of the 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 class system and how that can be so damaging about giving some people benefits but other people, you know, get the short end of the stick there. And to me, Dunkin' Egg, in my opinion, has way more pressure than I thought it was going to have. You know, when it was announced and it was coming out and it was, I, you know, coming out after House of the Dragon Season 2, I thought it was going to have very little pressure, given that it's a story that is basically completely written out for you. There isn't much you have to do in terms of, like, fire and blood. There's a lot of dialogue you've got to make up. There's a lot of filling in the gaps you got to do. Dunkin' Egg doesn't have that problem. Dunkin' Egg is a straight-up story. You have dialogue of the characters you have what they're thinking and maybe you can you know build some other stuff maybe some other characters that don't get as much time in it or you can do some other stuff which i'm assuming they're probably going to do more stuff with blood raven given where it's going uh but <laughs> i i don't know I, I think if duncan egg doesn't work in this season one i don't know how to expect that they're ever going to do something right like duncan egg to me is just it, you don't have any of the excuses of, oh, we don't have the budget. There's no dragons in Duncan Egg. It's a very small sca- like spur of a story. It's very personal. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's very similar. Like The best way I can explain it, if you haven't read the book or, or any of that, is if you think about like kind of Brienne and Podrick, how they're just kind of going around Westeros in like the later seasons, think about that, but good. That, that's more or less kind of what you can kind of see from it. It's like that, but also some of the cool parts and getting more of a personal feel of, of this world, not from the highborn perspective, because all these stories are always from the highborn perspective. So I'm, I'm, I'm not as worried about Duncan egg as I am house of the dragon season three, because I think it is easy Duncan egg, but we'll see. It, it has dampened my excitement. I agree. Yeah. And we say that you we say that like oh it should be an easy story to adapt but you know we've said that about other uh, other material within the a song of ice and fire series and we saw what happened <laughs> yeah unfortunately and, unfortunately uh, uh, real quick real quick before we move on uh i just wanted to ask you greece so obviously you know we're starting to get into the point where we have this uh game of thrones slash the song of ice and fire cinematic universe mm. uh you know i guess cinematic universes are the thing now we saw the same thing happen with marvel we saw the same thing happen with star wars however and i know this is subjective but in my opinion you know when when for example with marvel cinematic universe when i first saw loki season one i was like oh this is really cool but then they started pumping out so many other cin- uh, shows within the marvel cinematic universe and i kind of just got you know it, it st- I stopped becoming special it stopped being special i started becoming less interested and i just stopped watching it same with star wars like when mandalorian season one came out i was like holy smokes this is really and it was really good and then you know they started coming out with more material and just my excitement for it started to lessen and lessen do you think there's a worry here that 
you know, right now there is optimism from a lot of people for The Hedge Knight, but obviously there's a bunch of other shows that are currently in development within this cinematic universe. Do you think there's a worry that maybe they're doing a little too much and Game of Thrones will become less special and just over time, just nobody will care about these shows? Um, it depends on the quality of the shows. Uh, I, I think that was the biggest thing that screwed up Star Wars and Marvel was they started out pumping out all these products and half of them weren't very good or they were rushed or yeah. they were, you know, put there just because we needed a show. Uh, so, you know, your example of like Star Wars, for instance, well, Boba Fett, pretty bad. And it was also just an <laughs> intro to Mandalorian, really. Uh, and, you know, Obi-Wan, Obi-Wan. Kenobi could have just been like, a short like movie and they extended it out to six episodes and nothing really happens in the middle of that show. And it's also not very good either. <laughs> um, Marvel. I mean, it, it's the same, it's the same thing over and over again. It's just, you have kind of a mid tier show or low quality, like outside of like Marvel, I think has like one show that most people like truly love, which is Loki. Yeah. But as long as like, you're not we're not seeing a bunch of mid products from you know house of the dragon and Dunkin' egg and all this stuff like as long as they're still like high quality i don't think you're ever going to have that that fatigue because so many of these shows are completely different from one right whereas like house of the dragon is very similar to like game of thrones where it's you know the the big families and this war for the throne Dunkin' egg is the complete opposite Dunkin' egg is personal it's just a story about really two characters exploration and sometimes that does you know happen to affect some of the politics uh, of the world but not about that that's not the focus of the story and so now we're you know we're going to have something like Aegon's Conquest if they go through with that that is yeah. something that's again different it's not like a succession crisis between families for the throne it's you know making the throne to begin with it's it's how does Aegon conquer the kingdoms and how does he go about trying to integrate into their culture and all these things. It's a completely different type of story. And so I I think as long as the Game of Thrones products moving forward don't get into the pattern of being very, you know, okay and not really pushing those boundaries of being great and things like that, like that's the problem with House of Dragon Season 2 is House of Dragon Season 2 was a pretty okay mid-season. If you follow that up with Dunkin' Egg and it's pretty... Eh, like it, it doesn't get the book fans to be happy and it's also not something the casuals like well then we get into that conversation i'd be very interested to see where we sit on this conversation after duncan because that's when we should really revisit it that's when there could be a real worry if that is the case yeah yeah oh that's fair that's totally fair i just wanted to hear your two cents on the topic yeah i think it was great i think it's a great topic to to talk about but we've been going for quite a long time and i, I know you know i don't want to keep you all day but um I want to kind of finish out the, the video with just giving our like final rating of this. JC, go ahead. Give us your final rating out of 10 on season two of House of the Dragon. Yeah. So again, I've kind of softened a little bit over time uh, since this past week. And I thought, thought about it. I was like, okay, it wasn't all that bad. Cinematography, acting, production, that's all pretty great. And even the first four, even though I had some problems with the first four episodes, I still think those first four episodes were a really great you know, really great time. Uh, Again, it's when we get to that episode five that I start seeing problems. And then episode seven and eight, I just, you know, plot holes, character plots galore that I just didn't like. But I think all in all, if I had to think about it as a season as a whole, I would say six, maybe six and a half on a good day out of 10. That's what would be my final rating. Yeah, I've kind of flip flopped on this. I don't remember what I even gave it in, in our stream. I don't remember if I gave it a five or a Four. I know I gave the episode a four. I don't remember if I gave the season as a whole. Uh, you gave a it a six. I gave it a six. Okay, I yeah. think I think that's where I, where I'm on with a six. Um, because I think like there are some redeeming like qualities about this season, and so I don't want to like bury it. I don't want to give it a five or a four, but I think there's just so much here to me that was lacking that are major components of a season that just failed for me fundamentally. So yeah, I also agree. I had to give it. Uh, a six out of ten but yeah. um yeah so hopefully house dragon season three is better but i wanted to thank you jc for coming on the channel again also link will be in the description so check out his channel if you enjoyed this really long video did not plan on it being this we had a very good conversation but uh, yeah thank you for joining us jc 
Yeah, thanks for having me. Great discussion. Always love being here on the Grease Goblins channel. Guys, uh, go ahead, go through all of Grease's videos, like and comment some more. Get that algorithm, give them the algorithm love. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. <laughs> no problem. And uh, we will see you guys maybe in the future with some more Dunkin' Egg content as that grows closer or whatnot. See you guys in the next one. Bye, guys. Bye.